the summer of 1973 and things are heating up in South Vietnam as you and your opponent vie for control in Saigon 75, which was designed by Jean-Philippe Barkas and Pascal Tupi and published by Nuts Publishing, who sponsored this video. Hi everyone, my name is Candace Harris from Board Game Geek. We don't wanna miss the action in South Vietnam, so let's get down to the table to learn how to play Saigon 75. Saigon 75 is a historical strategy game where one to two players relive the struggles between North and South Vietnam from the summer of 1973 to spring 1975. One player, the NV player, controls the communist forces of the North, including the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong, while the other player, the SV player, controls the liberal forces of the South, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Each game is played over up to eight turns, and each turn represents a season of three months where players take turns activating and moving their units on the map and playing event cards to position themselves strategically for province control and combat. If the NV player is able to gain control of Saigon or eliminate all SV units before the end of the eighth turn, they win. Otherwise, the SV player wins the game. Let's go over the setup for Saigon 75. To begin setup, place the game board in the center of the table between both players. Then each player chooses the side they're going to play, either North Vietnam or South Vietnam, which I'll refer to as NV and SV going forward. Have both players take the units, markers, and five battle dice for their corresponding side. Next, each player places their pieces on the board. For the SV player, the majority of the provinces are marked with colored symbols indicating the starting spaces for most of their units. Place SV divisions wherever you see a yellow rectangle on the map. Make sure you are only placing the taller, full-strength yellow octagons and not the smaller ones. In fact, you can set the smaller SV divisions off to the side for now since they represent reduced strength SV divisions which come into play when you're hit during combat. When placing units on the map during setup, place them with the star side down, indicating they are not activated. Next, place ranger battalions and mechanized regiments on the map wherever you see orange and gray circles respectively. Randomly place the three objective tokens in the Quang Tri, Da Nang, and Binh Dien provinces as indicated by this black barrel symbol. Now the SV player places the rest of their units in provinces of their choice, noting the river patrol units may only be placed in Kamao, Khan Tho, Kian Jiang, and Long An provinces, and no province can have more than five units from one side. For your first game, if you aren't sure where you want to place the additional SV forces, I recommend mimicking how they're set up in the example of play found in the playbook for Saigon 75. Next, the NV player places their NV divisions, Viet Cong battalions, and the five infiltration markers in the NV reserve pool on the board, along with the Quiet Thang star-shaped markers in the dedicated space below the NV reserve pool. The reduced strength NV division should be placed off board, similar to the SV players. Both players should keep their activation plus one markers and their corresponding battle dice in front of them. The SV player will also have air support markers and two air attrition dice. Keep the D6 die near the board within reach of both players and place the turn marker on the first space of the turn record track, the summer 1973 space. Finally, shuffle the event cards and deal three to each player. After each player's event card subphase, draw a new event card so that you start each turn with three cards in hand. This is the recommended way to play with event cards for your first few games. After you have more experience, you deal eight cards to each player during setup and set aside the remaining four cards without looking at them. Those are your event cards for the entire game. Since this is a how to play video, we'll go with the beginner friendly three event card mode for now. Now you're ready to vie for control of Saigon. Saigon 75 is played over a maximum of eight turns and could end earlier if a victory condition is met. Each turn is divided into two phases, the NV player phase and then the SV player phase. Each player's phase consists of a number of consecutive sub-phases and whoever's phase it is, is considered the active player. Most of the sub-phases are the same for both sides, so I'll cover how each sub-phase works and call out any differences for the NV side versus the SV side. 
In addition, the SV side has a few additional subphases that the NV side does not have. Each turn, the NV player goes first and plays through each subphase. Then the SV player plays through each of their subphases. You can find the subphases for each player listed on their side of the board for easy reference. In the first subphase, determine unit availability, the active player determines how many units they can move and or attack with this turn by rolling a d6 and referring to the unit activation table on their side of the board. After you roll the d6, you look at the table modifier based on the turn number to see how many units you can activate. For example, on the SV player's first turn of the game, if they roll a 5, they'll be able to activate 9 units since the modifier is plus 4 for turns 1 through 3. This table also indicates the maximum number of units that can be activated for the current phase. You can also use and discard activation plus 1 markers to increase your number of activations for the turn. Even though you can use more than one activation plus 1 marker in the same turn, you can never go above your max. After figuring out how many units you can activate, then you'll activate the units of your choice by flipping them over to their starred side. For the NV player, you can activate NV divisions in South Vietnam as well as in the NV reserve pool, which historically represents that those units were in Cambodia, Laos, and North Vietnam. In addition to activating a number of NV divisions based on your die roll and the unit activation table, the NV player may activate up to two extra Viet Cong battalions. So if it's the NV player's first turn of the game and they roll a six, they can activate eight NV divisions with the plus two modifier and two VC battalions, which don't count towards their activation maximum. The SV player can either activate units on the map by flipping them star side up, or they can add air support markers in the indicated spaces on the game board. It costs one activation for each air support marker, and you can't ever have more than five markers on the board at a time. The SV player will be able to use these for combat support and to transport ranger units. At the end of the active player's phase, all activated units are turned back onto their non-activated side. Next, in the event card subphase, the active player must play one of the cards in their hand, and the corresponding event is in effect during their phase. There are 20 event cards with 6 to the advantage of the SV player, 12 to the advantage of the NV player, and 2 neutral cards. Each card has an event name, a background color indicating which side is advantaged by the event, and a description of the event's effect and timing. For example, when playing the Uprising event, the NV player may add one battle die to two combats in the phase, and they must declare it before each. Each event card is discarded after the event has been fulfilled or at the end of the active player's phase, depending on the card. After discarding, the active player then draws a new card so they have three cards in hand at the start of the next turn. If you're playing the eight card hand option, you do not refill your hand. Next, you can move your activated units in the movement subphase. All units have one movement point, aside from the mechanized SV units, which have two movement points. Moving into an adjacent province costs one movement point. An adjacent province is any province that shares a common border. For example, the province of An Lok is adjacent to the provinces of Huoc Binh, Saigon, and Long An, as well as the NV Reserve Pool. Movement for most units is pretty straightforward, but there are a few rules to call out. First, a unit may only move once per turn during its movement phase, and when a unit enters an enemy-controlled province, its movement stops immediately. However, any unit may freely leave a province that contains units from both sides. Only NV units may move to and from a border province of South Vietnam to the NV reserve pool. There are arrows on the board to indicate where NV units can move to in South Vietnam from the NV reserve pool. There's also a stacking limit of five units for each side in each South Vietnam province. The SV player has Marine, Ranger, and Paratrip units which may use special movement instead of their normal movement. Marine brigades may be moved from one coastal province to any other coastal province, regardless if it's adjacent or not. This special movement may also be used for retreat after combat as well. Paratroop brigades can be moved to any other province, adjacent or not. Ranger battalions may move like paratroop brigades, but you have to use an air support marker for each battalion moved this way, and the markers must be available on the air support spaces on the board. 
Anytime you use air support markers, you have to roll the air support attrition die for each air support marker used. And for each aircraft symbol you roll, one of the air support markers is eliminated for the rest of the game. Otherwise, it's placed back on the air support space and immediately becomes available again. River patrol units may only move between adjacent provinces where the Mekong River flows based on this water symbol. And while the SV mechanized units have two movement points, they must stop moving as soon as they enter a province that contains a mountainous terrain symbol. These special movement rules are all summarized on the back of the playbook for reference while playing. In the resolve combats phase, any activated unit belonging to the active player that is in the same province of at least one enemy unit may engage in combat. Combat is always optional. When you're the active player and you initiate combat, you are the attacker and your opponent is the defender. If you're initiating combat in multiple provinces, you decide the order that each combat is resolved and resolve each combat one at a time, noting there may only be one combat per province. As the attacker, you decide which of your activated units in a province will fight, but all enemy units present must take part in the defense. Although, there's one exception to this rule. A Viet Cong unit may only be attacked by the SV player if at least one ranger or river patrol unit is part of the attack. If not, the NV player may choose not to engage their VC battalions. However, a VC unit that attacks suffers all combat results that are inflicted by the defender, whether a ranger or river patrol unit is present or not. Combat lasts only one round, and the results of combat are considered to be simultaneous. At the start of combat, first the attacker announces how many combat units are engaging in the attack, as well as any bonus battle dice. Then the defender declares if any bonus battle dice are being used to support all of their combat units. And then each player rolls as many battle dice as they have engaged units, plus any potential bonus battle dice, noting a player may never roll more than five battle dice per combat. After both players roll their dice, the defender applies the combat results to their troops first, followed by the attacker. For each casualty result you roll, your opponent must either reduce a full strength division unit and replace it with a reduced strength division, or remove a reduced strength division or any other kind of unit from the game. When it comes to retreat symbols, you compare the amount of retreat symbols you and your opponent rolled and calculate the balance. For each excess retreat symbol, an enemy unit must retreat into an adjacent province. For example, if the MV player rolls two retreat symbols and the SV player rolls three, one NV unit must retreat. Needless to say, if both players roll the same amount of retreat symbols, no one is forced to retreat. There are some rules and restrictions to keep in mind when retreating. First off, each unit must retreat into an adjacent province under friendly control that contains more friendly units than enemy units. In the event a unit cannot retreat, the unit is reduced and therefore may be eliminated. Also, if a unit's retreat into a province would exceed the stacking limit, which is a max of five units per side, then that unit is eliminated. If a unit retreats into a province where a combat hasn't been resolved yet this phase, it does not participate in the combat, but it does suffer any adverse effects. Marine brigade units in a coastal province may retreat to any other SV-controlled coastal province, and only NV units may retreat into Cambodia, Laos, and North Vietnam, in which case they are placed in the NV reserve pool. It's also worth mentioning that at any point, the NV player may reconstitute a complete division out of two reduced divisions in the NV reserve pool. Also, each side has their own special retreat rule. An NV division may choose to be reduced rather than retreat, and SV units may choose to retreat voluntarily after combat. Earlier I mentioned you could potentially add bonus battle dice when in combat, so allow me to explain how that works. At the start of the game, the NV player has five infiltration markers, and you can use them in combat taking place in a province adjacent to Cambodia, Laos, or North Vietnam, the South Vietnam provinces with red arrows. To use an infiltration marker, the MV player must be the attacker, and only one counter can be used for each combat. The MV player must announce they're using it before rolling their battle dice, and then discard the marker after. I haven't talked much about the Quet Thang control markers yet, 
But if there's one in a province where the MV player is the defender in combat, they would also get to roll a bonus die. Meanwhile, the SV player has a number of air support markers available which can be used in combat to gain bonus battle dice. The SV player may use one or two air support markers for each friendly unit engaged in combat, but you can only use air support markers from the air support spaces on the board, meaning they were activated at some point. Place the air support markers in the province where the combat is happening. You can roll a bonus battle die for each air support marker you're using, up to a max of five total battle dice as usual. But you'll also need to roll an attrition die for each, and for each aircraft symbol rolled on the attrition dice, you must remove one of the air support markers from the game. Otherwise, you'll place them back on the air support space, making them available again. Air supports that survive the attrition roll or are not used are kept from one turn to the next. The SV player also always has a bonus battle die when defending in Saigon. After resolving all combats, you'll check province control, which is the last subphase for the NV player. At the start of the game, all provinces in South Vietnam are under SV control. A province that is occupied solely by units from one side is controlled by that side. A province occupied by units from both sides is controlled by the NV if it contains a Kruat Thang militia marker, and by the SV if it doesn't. After each combat phase, the NV player places a Kruat Thang militia marker in each province they control where there are no SV units. This marker indicates NV control of the corresponding province, and it also gives the NV player a bonus battle die when defending in combat in that province. If an SV unit enters a province controlled by the NV player where there are no NV units and only a Quet Thang militia marker, it's immediately removed and the province becomes SV controlled again. In this case, the SV unit would immediately cease movement. After combat in a province under NV control, if only a Quet Thang militia marker is in the space, the province stays under NV control. However, if the SV player has more units than the NV player after combat, then the Quet Thang militia marker is removed and the province is returned to SV control again. Saigon is the exception here, since the SV player would only have to have as many units as the NV player to take control back. Also, any empty province not under NV control is considered to be under SV control. If it was the NV player's phase, after checking province control, the SV player would begin their phase by determining unit availability and working through the subphases I've already described. But after the SV player's check province control subphase, there are three additional subphases. In the SV desertion subphase, the SV player counts the provinces controlled by the NV, and if there are more than five, rolls a die and consults the desertion table on the board to determine the number of SV units that desert and are removed from the board. A full strength SV division represents two units for this purpose, so it's totally fine to reduce a division, which would count as one unit deserting. Units that desert are removed from the board by the SV player in the following order. First, units and provinces that border Cambodia, Laos, or North Vietnam and have units from both sides. Second, units and provinces that border Cambodia, Laos, or Vietnam. Third, units in a province occupied by units from both sides, with the exception of Saigon. And finally, all other SV units. On turns three, five, and seven, there's a special subphase to check which side controls the province with the objective token corresponding to the turn that is just finishing. The player who controls the province at the end of the SV player's phase takes the token and can use it during a future turn in one of four ways. You can use it as an extra activation during the unit availability phase. You can use it to reroll one die for unit availability or combat. You can use it to discard one event card and draw a replacement card from the deck, or you can use an objective token to move two units anywhere on the map without activating them. They can't take part in combat, but they also do not count towards the maximum number of units they may be activated for the current turn. Regardless of how many objective tokens you have, you may only use one per turn, and they're removed from the game after they're used. In the last subphase on the SV player's turn, you'll check victory conditions. If at the end of any turn the NV player controls Saigon, or if the SV player has no more units on the board, the game ends and the NV player wins. If the NV player is not in control of Saigon at the end of turn 8, the SV player wins. 
If the game does not end, advance the turn marker and continue playing with the next NV phase. There are also some special rules for turn 8 that I should mention. If units from both sides occupy Saigon on turn 8, the SV units may not leave the province and must attack, meaning units in Saigon must be given priority for activation. If there are not enough activations to activate all of the units in Saigon, only the units that are activated may fight. However, combat results suffered by the SV side are applied to all units, even the ones that weren't activated. And that's how you play Saigon 75. There are also rules included for playing solo and a playbook with the historical background details and a helpful example of play, which I'll leave you to discover on your own. Saigon 75 is an excellent first game in the Under Pressure or Up series from Nuts Publishing, which is a series all about simple and fast playing strategy games on unique historical topics. The asymmetrical gameplay between the two factions combined with the variety of event cards keeps things very interesting while also playing quickly at a low complexity level so you can play it with just about anyone. If Saigon 75 looks like a game you'd enjoy, be sure to check out its page on Board Game Geek to learn more. I'm Candace Harris from Board Game Geek, and that is how you play Saigon 75. Have a wonderful day.